Good morning. Welcome to the Boardwalk Talks program brought to you by the Aquarium at the Dauphin Island Sea Lab. My name is Mendel Graber. I am one of the educators here at the lab and we will be chatting with Alex Marquez this morning Hello. who um, is going to tell us about his research on um, plankton and how uh, detritus that falls through the water column to the bottom, which we called um, marine snow can contribute uh, toxic compounds to the uh, sediment and potentially to the food web. So with that, I am going to let Alex tell you about it. Well, uh, thank you, Mendel, for that introduction. And thank you, everyone that's joining in today. Uh, so what I'm presenting today is one of my dissertation chapters. Uh, this was done in collaboration with the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Uh, they have a, a seafood safety lab here on the island. And uh, we have a joint fellowship program between the Sea Lab and the FDA, which uh, promotes uh, opportunities for students like myself to work in the government lab with government scientists and, and try and solve um, seafood safety issues that um, relate to human health impacts. And so my, my research focused on a neurotoxin that's called domoic acid. It's produced by a single-celled algae known as Pseudonychia. Uh, they look something like this. So this is a, a scaled model um, of, of Pseudonychia. You can see it's kind of a pencil shaped, we call it a, a pinnate shaped diatom. Um, these diatoms are, are found all across um, the world in, in various waters. Um, not all of the, the species um, of Pseudonychia are toxic. Um, and the amount of toxicity uh, or amount of toxin that these diatoms produce varies from you know, highly toxic to, to low, low toxic cells. Um, <clears throat> and so the, the primary, way, primary way by which this toxin, and uh, primary way by which humans can get sick from this toxin is by eating contaminated seafood. Uh, things like shellfish, uh, oysters, uh, mussels, clams, uh, as well as um, fish like sardines, anchovies, uh, menhaden, and, and mullet. Uh, and so it poses a threat to us, but also to marine life. Um, there's been several cases of um, strandings of sea lions and, and whales, as well as uh, marine birds. Um, and so they, they can eat uh, contaminated seafood as well, and, and, and that poses a threat to them. Um, over the last couple of years, this, this particular diatom has been a growing concern, um, especially on the west coast of the U.S. Uh, actually, in 2015, uh, there was this a large bloom of the species that spanned from the Gulf of Alaska all the way down the, the western coast of, of Canada and the U.S. down to San Diego. This was a record, record levels of abundance of these diatoms as well as um, the toxicity. So there's been more research on this, trying to um, focus on um, the production of this toxin and how it moves through the food web. And so one of the the um, questions that we have is we've been during through monitoring uh, we've seen that this toxin is present even when pseudonychia is long gone so the these phytoplankton will bloom and die off and then even several weeks later uh, this toxin can still be detected in the water and also in animals that don't typically eat this algae um, so one of the, one of its primary uh, consumers are copepods now this isn't to scale uh, these are generally uh, a lot larger than, than, than the Pseudonychia, the, you know, maybe, maybe like this big. Um, and so copepods, they, um, they, can, uh, they serve as, as, as a vector or they help transfer this toxin into, uh, from the Pseudonychia up to higher trophic levels like the fish and, and um, other consumers. So the, the research question that we were trying to look at is, again, what, is, there, is there another mech, another process by which this toxin enters the food web besides directly consuming um, our toxin producer. And so the, the way we set up our experiment, uh, we had uh, several bottles uh, like these, or sorry, let me, let me back up. <laughs> our hypothesis was that um, marine snow, uh, this gelatinous kind of uh, sticky material that forms uh, in, the, in, the, in the ocean uh, would uh, somehow stick, stick, or the toxin would stick onto that surface and then organisms like copepods and the fish would eat that toxin as well. Now, as marine snow is formed um, from very small particles, so when, when 
cells die, they'll release a lot of uh, kind of, well, they'll just release their insides. Like, uh, this is fats and proteins, and those small particles, through turbulence and, and uh, mixing in, in the ocean, they can start to stick together and form these larger particles. And those particles are big enough to be consumed by, by copepods and fish. So the way we designed our experiment was to um, have some bottles. We, we would fill these bottles with filtered seawater. So we take out all, all the algae and, and leave only the tiniest particles available. We then add our toxin into the water and then pop the copepods in there. And then uh, we, to simulate uh, mixing from, from the ocean, we put it on a shaker table. You know, have a, we'd, we'd have several bottles here, let it shake for about a day. And then after it shakes, uh, you know, this would slosh water around and hopefully um, help form marine snow. After the day is done, we take our bottle, we pluck out the copepods that are in there, and then filter this material uh, uh, and, or filter the water onto a filter. Now the toxin itself is, is small enough that it would pass through this filter. It can't be captured on there. So the only way that we'd be able to measure uh, the toxin on the filter is if it was stuck on marine snow. We were able to do so. Uh, we, we measured that. And then our last step was to see if the copepods had ingested this material. And so we have to grind the copepods out, up, and sacrifice them for science. And, and lo and behold, we measured toxin in the copepods as well. So that demonstrated that uh, the toxin sticks onto the marine snow, and the marine snow can, can be eaten by these copepods. Now, what's, what's this mean for kind of our, our bigger picture? So we, our, our traditional, uh, the, the traditional thinking is, or we know that direct consumption of our toxin producer by copepods and fish uh, will will move the uh, the toxin into the food web, but now with with our study, now this this process was hypothesized, but we're to our knowledge we're the first to uh, demonstrate that this that this actually happens. So the Pseudonychia uh, rele released the toxin into the water, and then we already have kind of extra, you know, lots of dead material and and, and other marine snow particles in the water. Uh, so. Through mixing, uh, wind mixing, and, and ocean currents, and as well as kind of fish swimming through the water, this can help form larger particles of marine snow. Uh, the toxin then can also stick onto this marine snow. These particles are big enough that they can then be ingested by our uh, copepods and fish, as well as, as shellfish. But the other important thing is. Um, this marine snow is, uh, they're large, they're fairly large particles, so they, they sink, they sink to the, to the benthos. And here, uh, in, they can either be buried in the sediment or consumed by other benthic organisms. And here, uh, for example, in the northern Gulf of Mexico, we have very shallow water, uh, going, uh, very shallow or broad continental shelf, which makes for very, uh, shallow water. So when you get big storms, like a tropical storm or even a hurricane, that mixes the entire water from top to bottom, which also disturbs the sediment down here. And so any toxin that has been stored in the sediment is now resuspended. It's back in the water. And these particles can then be ingested um, potentially by uh, fish and copepods. And so this process um, has implications for how we monitor um, this for, for the specific toxin. So generally, we're only looking for the presence of our algae or the presence of the toxin in the water. But now we have to account for this kind of invisible particle um, that can also carry the toxin and, and serve as a, as a source of the toxin for, for other organisms. Um, and so our, our studies showed it specifically for this, for this toxin. Now, there's also, um, there's also concern that this uh, that this process might apply to other toxins. So Pseudonychia fits into this broad category of, of harmful algae, uh, algae that produce toxins and can potentially have negative impacts on humans as well as uh, the marine ecosystem. One of the other uh, algae, harmful algae are uh, Carinia brevis. And so this is, a, this is a, a bigger problem here in the Gulf of Mexico. 
This is the organism that's responsible for the red tide. And um, we think that you know, it's, it's worth investigating whether this process with marine snow also applies to toxins produced by Carinia brevis. It's brevitoxin. Uh, in freshwater systems, um, there are cyanobacteria, and they produce cyanotox cyanotoxins. And this process may also apply there. So this uh, research um, has broader implications for, uh, again, our monitoring for seafood safety, and then also understanding how long um, these toxins are present in, in, the, in the food web. Um, and that's, yeah, that's, that's what I've got for you guys today. So Alex, um, some of the folks who are watching might uh, have heard of um, harmful algal blooms. Mm -hmm. I always like to point out that these organisms, although they may photosynthesize and they are algae and they are uh, plant-like, it's not actually a bloom. Um, so could you talk about what a, an algae bloom is and maybe some of the factors that contribute to an algae bloom? Sure. Uh, so there's, there's a couple a couple things here. Um, so they, they are plant-like, um, and uh, they, they need nutrients just, just like plants on land, right? Uh, that's like, things like nitrogen and phosphorus. And those nutrients are, are really good for growth. And so part of, part of the issue with these, um, not just the harmful algae, but just phytoplankton blooms in general, uh, are, we have a, a lot of runoff from uh, rivers and streams, um, and then that are carrying lots of nitrogen and phosphorus from, from fertilizers from like farmland. So uh, here in the Gulf of Mexico, the, the Mississippi River drains you know, mo a lot of the continental US uh, and, and, and pushes a lot of that um, nitrogen and phosphorus into the water. And so those extra nutrients that are put in the water can then uh, stimulate the phytoplankton to, to, to really grow. Uh, blooms are natural. We generally see a spring, a spring bloom in general and that has to do with uh, kind of nutrient availability in, in, in the ocean. Um, but uh, these, these kind of artificial blooms that are, that are enhanced by uh, human activity um, can also, can also uh, stimulate that. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> sorry, that's it. So um, I know this is sort of a side note to what you're talking about, but um, they can also contribute to low oxygen conditions mm -hmm. in the water. So if you've heard of the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico or hypoxia, um, so when there is a harmful, or not just a harmful algal bloom, when there's an algae bloom, I know uh, if you're thinking, you're thinking that, uh, well, these organisms, if they photosynthesize, are probably producing oxygen rather than consuming oxygen, but this leads to low oxygen conditions when they hit some kind of limiting factor, and um, you'll have a major die-off of the algae, and then bacteria start consuming the algae, and it's the bacteria that consume the, water, uh, the oxygen in the water and, and produce these low oxygen conditions. Right, and, and I'd like to point out, uh, so yes, we, we generally can talk about the, the dead zone in, in the Gulf of Mexico, but I I like to can talk about it more specifically as a low oxygen zone. It's, it's, not, it's not dead. So there's plenty of bacteria and microbes that are thriving in those conditions. We call it dead because a lot of the, the larger animals that we're interested in, fish, uh, sharks, and you know, crabs, the things that can leave, they, they, will, they will scatter. So in, in that sense, it's, it's dead. There's a low abundance of these, these larger animals. Um, but it's a very much, uh, very biologically active um, in terms of bacteria and the microbes. And uh, the, the harmful algae, again, they're, um, they don't always produce toxins. And uh, it's, it, those, that's, that's research that's, that's still ongoing, trying to figure out which conditions are, are prime for um, more production of the toxin or less production. Um, these blooms can also be controlled by the grazers, the things that eat them. Um, so if there's a really high abundance, uh, so sometimes the, the, when the algae bloom, They'll either, they can die off because uh, they've already used up all the nutrients and there isn't a whole lot left, or you get a big pulse of their grazers or predators and they chow everything down. So uh, you can think of like a, you know, have a, a big open field with um, like cows or something and they just mow down all the grass. It's the same thing with these copepods. They'll go through and just chow, chow down on all these uh, diatoms and so that can actually um, that's, that's one thing that can actually control a, a bloom um, besides just the nutrients.
All right, we have a question from Blair. Do copepods like to eat pseudonychia or do they prefer to eat other diatoms? Does this affect the rate that the toxin cycles through the food web? Uh, thank you for the questions. It's very good. Uh, so uh, there's, it's interesting. Some, some of the studies have, have, have thought about like, why, why, do, why do algae in general produce toxins? Is it a, a defense mechanism that helps deter they're grazers, you know, like, oh, I, don't, I don't taste good, you know, like, you shouldn't eat me. Um, but a lot of, there, there's kind of conflicting, uh, conflicting results. This is still, there's not a, a consensus, uh, specifically with Sudanicia, on whether this uh, toxin is a defense mechanism or not. Some uh, copepods will gladly eat uh, a, a toxic species of diatom versus a non-toxic, and there really doesn't seem to be any effect on their behavior um, or their egg production or survival rate. Um, the other thing to consider there is that these, you know, these organisms have, have evolved together. So perhaps the copepods have evolved a way to either uh, get rid of the toxin faster or um, just have some sort of um, an immunity to it um, where it doesn't really affect them. Um, yeah, so that's still, that's still kind of up in the air, whether, whether it's a, a bad thing for the copepods or not. Um, but it definitely affects, um, again, higher up, higher order organisms like mammals and birds, it definitely affects their, their nervous systems. Um, fun fact, actually, uh, that the movie The Birds, you know, it's based um, off of a story from Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, that, that is based off, um, or we think is based off of a, uh, a toxic event from Sudanicia. So the birds, you know, ate a lot of fish that had uh, high amounts of toxins, and then they had erratic flying patterns and were flying into uh, into cars and buildings, but it's because the toxin was um, affecting their nervous system. Um, so, a little film, a little, film history for you there. Yeah, exactly. So in looking at how this gets into the food web here, mm -hmm. how do you determine if a fish has the toxin in it? So what's a way that they decide if a fish or a seal, how do they look at that? What do they, do they take skin samples? Are they able to take liver samples? What's mm -hmm. the... Yeah, so um, when, when we look at fish or, or marine mammals, um, well, with the fish specifically, you can either look at, um, you can sacrifice the animal and uh, do a gut content analysis. So you can take the, the viscera, their intestines, and, and uh, measure, measure it there. Uh, or you can take uh, like a little biopsy punch of the muscle if you're not taking the whole animal. Um, and so you can, you can look at different compartments, you know, kind of different parts of the fish and see where the toxin is, or you can analyze the entire fish together and, and look, you know, this, it, it's in the body. Um, but generally it's, it's separated by, uh, scientists like to separate by like, you know, kind of gut content versus muscle, because if it's, if it's in the gut, um, it may not necessarily have a, a absorbed into the bloodstream yet. Um, but if you look at the muscle and it's, and it's in there, then it's like, well, that's, um, that is, that's more important for, for humans. I mean, we're not generally eating the viscera of a fish, uh, but so if it's in the muscle tissue, then that's a higher, that's a greater concern for, for human health safety. Um, for mammals, uh, they can, they'll look at their feces. Um, that's always very interesting to look at. Poop can tell you a lot about <laughs> uh, uh, an animal's health. Um, if the animal's dead, then yeah, they'll do um, a couple other analyses. Um, and if they're rehabilitating them, they can take, you know, biopsy punches and stuff like that. Is mm. there a way for these animals to recover from the, if it's a neuro issue? Uh, that I don't know. I haven't, I haven't read too much on that. Um, I mean, they'll definitely have, I mean, like stranded, there's been stranded whales that have tested positive for, for the demoic acid. Uh, and so that's, they're not sure if that's the, the direct cause of why the mammal was stranded, but it's, it's, it suggested that you know it's probably one of the things why it got stranded. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about the recovery rates. I mean, if, if it's a low toxicity, they can probably recover and, and eventually you know remove that toxin from their uh, from their body. Um, yeah. So, it, with monitoring, is there the potential to predict these events, or is it usually uh, discovering them once they are uh, in effect? Right, so there's a, a really big, uh, it's, it's called uh, the Northern, or there's a Southern California and as well as a Northern California Ocean Observing System, and it's SCUS and NCUS, 
is the acronym. And this is a team of scientists all across uh, California. And they're looking into exactly this. We want to, the whole point of science is to, to find something and then be able to eventually work to be able to predict these events. And especially if we're looking at seafood safety, uh, that's something that we really want to look into. Uh, so just to give you the, the kind of monetary value in, in that, that event that happened in 2015, there were uh, like a billion dollars lost in, um, in, in uh, revenue from shutting down mussel harvesting, Dungeness crab, uh, you know, these really valuable fisheries. And so what these ocean observing systems do is look at um, ocean conditions, so kind of currents, because currents can move, you know, algae from one area into another and potentially uh, stimulate a bloom there. So move it from an area that's maybe not conducive for a bloom and move it to another area where there's more nutrients. Uh, ocean mixing can also bring up nutrients to, to stimulate that bloom. Uh, so these uh, ocean observing systems are looking at uh, you know, physical conditions, chemical con conditions, and then uh, sampling for the biology itself. So uh, especially with ocean sciences, it's, you need to cover kind of all, all three of those, um, uh, um, all three of those disciplines to, to be able to get a, a, big, a more, you know, a bigger picture and more concise uh, you know, kind of like, w what is the whole system doing together? And then take each of those bits to then make a, a better prediction. Um, so there's a balance, um, I mean, uh, sort of analogous to COVID between protecting human health and protecting the, you know, the jo jobs, the livelihoods of these folks. So you don't want to shut down the industry unnecessarily and impact their um, businesses, and you also don't want to allow the human health effects. Right, right. Um, uh, one of the in, so in, in uh, Washington and Oregon, the, their state departments work with uh, indigenous tribes there. Uh, that um, they have kind of uh, shellfish grounds that they generally go to harvest uh, for subsistence, uh, mussels, and I can't remember what the other shellfish are. Uh, but they work closely with those indigenous tribes to help monitor their shellfish beds um, so that they, they don't get sick as well. So it's not just a uh, you know, big, big indi commercial industry, also for recreational harvest and then uh, subsistence um, harvesting from indigenous tribes as well. So uh, scientists uh, um, from both uh, academia and then and government agencies are, are working all in collaboration to, uh, to, to monitor this stuff and, and get better at predicting it. And so, I mean, that's, that's the example for Sudanicha, but we're doing the same thing here in the Gulf with Carinia brevis um, and, and other harmful algae. You know, trying to kind of each each region has its areas of, of larger concern or, or species that they're more concerned with, and so take those same principles and then apply them to the area that you're in. Alex, have you uh, or do you know of anyone who's sampled for the toxins in the sediment, uh, or you know, I, in a sediment sample that would have marine snow in it? Right. So I, I don't personally know them. I've, I've read some of the papers, but uh, there have been, so aside from shellfish and crabs, there have also been documented uh, reports of domoic acid in, in well, benthic worms um, and uh, starfish or sea stars, sorry. Um, uh, just, yeah, kind of a whole slew of, of benthic organisms. It's can I, anything you can imagine, like, yes, there's been not necessarily high levels, but it's there. And so that's that's at least demonstrating that this toxin is, is more prevalent in the marine ecosystem than we initially thought. And again, worms don't directly eat Sudanicha. They can potentially eat the, the dead cells that get to the bottom. Um, but a very small portion of the material that rains down actually makes it to, um, makes it to the, the sediment surface. And so if there's kind of just free dissolved domoic acid in the water, this marine snow can kind of you know, scavenge that or, or, or grab it from the water and then and take that to the, to the benthos. Um, so yes, there's the, the toxins is present from, from in the water column and, and then organisms in the benthos as well. Are there a lot of, is there um, a lot of documentation of adverse health effects on benthic organisms or is that just sort of something that has been observed but it hasn't been seen to cause much of a problem? Yeah, I'm not sure about the behavioral um, for, for, for the benthic organisms. And that'd be something that you have to do in the lab. 
Uh, they have done studies with copepods um, to see if there's kind of any, any effects on their behavior. And some of the studies have shown a slight decrease in their swimming speeds. Um, again, more erratic behavior versus, um, again, I mean, they're already kind of spastic, um, but uh, you know, the research that they're doing, uh, people who are really focused on copepods can determine that. Um, but yes, sl slower swimming speeds or escape velocities. Um, escape velocities is like, you know, these antenna help, help to detect fish or, or other predators. Um, and so they can, they can you know, jolt really fast. Um, but measuring those after they've had a, been exposed to a lot of domoic acid, it, it's, um, there's a, a decrease in that, in that speed. And so which would make them more, uh, more prone to being uh, predated upon. Um, so I know you're primarily focusing on the um, Pseudonychia here, but uh, do you want to tell a little bit more about some of the ones that are more common in our area? Sure, yeah. So, so we mentioned Curinia brevis. Uh, this is the red tide organism. This, you know, this, uh, this, the toxin that they produce can be aerosolized. So uh, there's been you know, people that they'll say, you know, stay away from the beach, um, don't go in the water. Uh, but this, uh, the waves when they're crashing can actually you know, break these cells open and that uh, the toxin is then kind of in, in the sea spray and can get carried inshore by, um, by the wind. And so people even, you know, uh, half mile or maybe even uh, or so from, from the shore can still have uh, respiratory issues. Uh, Alexandrium is another uh, dinoflagellate, uh, which is a, it's just a type of algae. This is what Carina brevis is. Uh, Dinoflagellate just meaning that it has, it has this flagella that helps, helps it uh, swim. Um, and uh, they also produce, I can't, I'm, I'm blanking on the toxin that they produce, um, but um, that, that's also uh, uh, pretty common here in the Gulf. Uh, the, the, the dinoflagellate blooms tend to be more of a concern here in the Gulf. Um, but they're, uh, and then let's see, uh, the cyanotoxin. So if people remember, I don't know if it was like a year or two ago with a, uh, I think it was Lake Okeechobee in Florida had this really like massive green you know, kind of sludge uh, on top of it. And that was just this really dense bloom of cyanobacteria. Uh, again, not, not all of the cyanobacteria produce, tox uh, produce a cyanotoxin, um, but that can be also a, a, potential, uh, a potential hazard. So, uh, you know, from, from in, in Florida, for instance, you know, that, that water is really, it's really closely connected to um, to the marine waters. So the fresh water mixing with, uh, well, this, this was the instance they actually had a mixing of, you know, this cyanobacteria and Carinia brevis at the same time. So they were having these, you know, these big, uh, you know, blooms in, in both types of water, coast, uh, coastal marine and then uh, fresh waters. And a lot of that they think is, is um, you know, influenced by uh, really high nutrient levels from uh, just, just runoff from farms and, and things like that. So I know you kind of touched on this, but um, could you just sort of uh, reiterate the some of these organisms that are capable of producing these toxins, they don't constantly produce the toxins, and then they produce uh, different levels of the toxin mm -hmm. at, at different given times, but that process is still not, the factors that contribute to their production of the toxin are still not well understood, right? Right. So, so again, one of the things is, uh, you know, is this a predator defense mechanism? So they'll, they'll, they'll place, you know, pseudonychia in the same bottle with the toxin or with the copepod um, and actually separate them. It's kind of a, this, like a thin membrane. So that way, whatever these, whatever the copepods are releasing, some sort of chemical cues can potentially signal to pseudonychia, like, oh, there's a predator nearby, like we should, we should ramp up production. Um, or they'll have, you know, pseudonychia on one side and copepods and pseudonychia on the other. And perhaps it's the fact that uh, the cues from the pseudonychia that are releasing, because they're getting, you know, grazed upon, it's like this is a you know, signaling to the rest of the population. This, this happens with plants on land as well, where um, some plants will release uh, some sort of cue into, into the environment and you'll see that other, other plants start to produce, increase their toxins. And so, um, those experience, ha, experiments have been done, and, and copepods, or the, sorry, the pseudonychia will actually increase uh, toxin production, so the cells will become slightly more toxic in the presence of, of the copepods. But then the copepods aren't necessarily affected by the toxin itself. Uh, 
Other things um, are uh, nutrient limitation. So diatoms, uh, so this is, this is a, di a diatom, it's a type of algae. Uh, the unique characteristic about diatoms is that they have this, uh, it's essentially a glass house. Their shell is made out of, of silica, glass. And so they need silicon, which is uh, the element, to be able to make, make their shell. And so when that nutrient specifically is, is really low, uh, this nutrient limitation can actually ramp up toxin production in, in the Sudanicia. Uh, they've also shown it. But is, there a, is there an idea why? That, uh, no, I'm not sure. Uh, that, that, that I don't know. Um, there's also been for uh, increased CO2. So more CO2 in the, uh, in the water. So, sorry, uh, CO2, uh, carbon dioxide. Um, it diffuses into the water from the atmosphere. And there's also been shown that higher uh, CO2 concentrations can, can stimulate production in, of the toxin. And, and I think the hypothesis there is that, uh, well, the toxin is, you know, in order to produce a toxin, you need carbon as well. So this kind of excess carbon is kind of just dumped into, into something that's, you know, if you have excess, I can, I can make all these you know, extra extra products and one of those extra products is the toxin and so that's one of the concerns moving forward with uh, climate change is that where we have higher co2 levels in the atmosphere um, and that can potentially uh, you know, show that the stimulate higher production of, of this toxin in in uh, sudanicia um, so there's that's that's an area that uh, you know, ongoing research mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, there might be an increased amount of the harmful al algal compounds. The organisms themselves at different times may or may not be producing those compounds, but <clears throat> excuse me. But the, the increase of those toxins may be related to more of the algal cells, so a bloom of the algal cells, or it may be related to some other factor that is um, stimulating them to produce a higher level of uh, toxin, right? Right, right. Um, and uh, let me kind of backtrack back to the, the silicon and carbon limitation. Um, here in the Gulf, uh, we've, you know, again, I mentioned that there's a lot of nutrient runoff and that gets, uh, you know, taken from, from the Mississippi River and, and kind of other big uh, water systems like here in the Mobile Bay as well. As well. There's a lot of uh, water coming in. Um, but those, the, the, the amount of nutrients in there, um, it's, it's kind of higher in nitrogen and higher in phosphorus, but, but not too much, or, or there's a reduced amount of silicon because uh, kind of due to damming and uh, kind of uh, removal of sediments. Um, and so these, uh, by having you know, look, this kind of compounded effect of, of lower silicon relative to these other nutrients, um, as well as higher CO2, that can be a compounding effect that um, increases the production even more. And so there's um, not, maybe not necessarily that it increases the production, but also uh, the abundance of, of Sudanicia. And so they, they might be more abundant, um, maybe, maybe not as toxic, but there's the fact that they're more abundant, so, well, there's, there's potentially a, a higher, higher likelihood that they, they may produce um, you know, more, more toxin in, in those cases. Do you, does the toxin affect other um phytoplankton or other organisms that might be um, uptaking some of those the silicon or some of the other compounds that they... So could the um, toxicity be a response to competition for limited resources? Uh, I'm not sure if it affects other phytoplankton. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm unaware of that. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I think I think the bigger thing is like how, how it affects its uh, the grazers, the, the things that are eating eating it. Um, oh, actually, no, here it is. So uh, demoic acid is also so besides being a, a toxin, it's also been shown to be able to scavenge or uh, kind of uh, bind uh, copper and I forgot what other metal. Um, but these are these are trace metals, right? There, there's. You know, we, we need iron and things. Oh, so co copper and iron have been shown to bind really well with the, the toxin. And so one of the hypotheses there is that, you know, just like we need, you know, if you're anemic, you need to take iron supplements. 
Well, algae also need very small traces of these elements to be able to photosynthesize and, and carry out other cell processes. And so by, by, re by releasing the toxin, um, that toxin can then bind, uh, bind the, the trace metal, the ionic form of it, and then it becomes uh, bioavailable for Pseudonychia to, to reabsorb that and then incorporate that for their so metabolic. So in that case, it's not functioning as a toxin. It's just toxic as a, uh, you know, it's just toxic as a side effect if that's right. sort of how it's functioning. Right. So, um, yeah, it can, it, it's, it's a way to outcompete the other phytoplankton in this case. So, so not directly affecting them, but it's a, you know, I'm going to take these resources before others can get it sort of, mm -hmm. sort of thing. So, um, yeah, nutrient acquisition, trace metals, and then also potentially a, a grazer deterrent uh, for, for the predators that consume it. Does, it, does the demoic acid affect um, calcium carbonate? Uh, so to, in, in what sense, like a, absorbing dissolve it? Dissolve it? Oh, dissolve it? And not that I'm aware of, no. Okay. Um, that is more related to the, the pH of the water. So mm -hmm. uh, more acidic water will, will dissolve or, or make it more difficult for calcifying organisms to, to make their shells. So it's not, it's not a high enough concentration of that acid or it doesn't combine with the water in such a way that it... Right, right. So um, yeah, the, the thing that's going to affect um, the pH more is going to be the amount of CO2 that's going in the water more than um, this toxin. You know, the, it, it's called amoic acid because it's, I think it's got an acidic group on it. Um, but it's not necessarily something that's going to increase the pH, and, and, and definitely not at the the amount the amount that they're releasing into the water is uh, is not going to affect the the, the the pH in that sense. Yeah. Okay, we have another question from Blair. Can climate change affect the frequency of Pseudonychia blooms? Can warming temperatures affect rain, range expansions of these toxic species? Uh, potentially. So. Yeah, I'd be wary. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna. I'm gonna be uh, cautious with my answer there. Uh, they've so, so these these organisms are are, are cosmo, or what we would say cosmopolitan. They're found everywhere in their ocean. They've been found in the Antarctic. They've been found in the Arctic. You know, literally, every, you know, anywhere across the, like the oceans. You know, you Pseudonychia has been documented. Um, so it it may it may affect. Uh, you know, the, the warmer, the species that are maybe found in, in, you know, kind of more temperate or warmer climates down here, if, if there's, uh, yeah, if there's warming waters, then potentially they, they can expand there. Uh, but I'm, uh, yeah, I'm not sure how, how much that, that would affect its range expansion because, because they're already found kind of everywhere. So it might affect sp specific species of Pseudonychia, but uh, as a genus, as a whole, they're already kind of, they're kind of everywhere. Are there some effects from um, upwelling that uh, are relevant to the Pseudonychia um, community? Right, so, so upwelling in general, so upwelling is a process by which um, water, deep water is brought up to the surface. Um, so winds will push water offshore and something has to come and replace it. So then the, the deeper water comes up and, and replaces that. That nutrient, that Deep water is, is nutrient rich. So um, everything that's been uh, at the surface has, has sunk to the, or things that have sunk to the bottom, they've been degraded or um, broken down by bacteria and back to their kind of basic constituents. So you've got lots of nutrients and upwelling in general uh, helps stimulate phytoplankton blooms. These are again, nutrient rich waters that uh, bring stuff back to the surface. And so the, that process, yeah, can, can um, stimulate Pseudonychia, but it wouldn't just it wouldn't just be targeted towards them. You know, it'd be like the entire the entire phytoplankton community would would kind of bloom. But within there, that's where these uh, interesting aspects of like scavenging uh, trace metals with the toxin can can provide a competitive advantage for Pseudonychia to outcompete other phytoplankton in in the same conditions. Uh, so is there anything that you feel like is an important um, takeaway? Oh, for this? Uh, yeah. So uh, again, this, is, this research is looking at how, um, how, how, we should, how we can improve our monitoring for, for seafood safety. Um, looking at a, it, this is a, a novel pathway of, of, of this 
toxin being moved through the food web. This helps us better understand um, how long it resides in, in a marine ecosystem. Uh, you know, again, if it's buried in the sediment, this can potentially hang out for, well, I'm not going to st stipulate uh, or speculate on, on the time frame, but it, we, the toxin can be present without the toxin producer uh, being there. So um, just because Sudanichi is gone doesn't mean that the toxin has gone. And so that means we have to keep, we have to be vigilant uh, in our monitoring uh, all the time. Um, and, and then is again, that, is that research being done? Like how long it may persist in the uh, environment after it's released by the Sudanichia? Yeah. So one of the, uh, domolic acid is easily broken down by UV rays. Um, so if it's in, you know, released at the surface, it's, it's quickly degraded by, by UV radiation. Um, but if it's, if this toxin binds onto the marine snow and is moved further away, you know, further from the surface, that kind of protects that, deg that degradation process. There are some bacteria that can break it down, but those are generally found in the, the guts of like oysters and things that, you know, constantly are, are, are kind of filtering. Um, but, uh, for, you know, kind of free floating communities of bacteria haven't really been shown to break this toxin down. Um, but it's, it's, it's a very hardy <laughs> compound. Um, there is a paper recently published, I believe in 2019, uh, that they were able to measure a very small amount. I think it was uh, in the, the picomole range. So this is uh, like 10 to the, 10 to the negative 12 uh, moles. I, it's a very, 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 very tiny amount of this toxin, but it was measured at a, a 5,000 meter depth um, off the coast of, I think it was Africa, somewhere down here. Um, and so um, the, the authors there speculate that the toxin was you know, bound to something else um, uh, or else how, you know, how else would it get all the way down there unless like a, a couple pseudon HSLs, cells you know, made it all the way down to the benthos. And that, that's a long way to travel for a cell to, to make it without being, without being uh, broken down by bacteria. So their hypothesis was that it was probably bound to something like marine snow or these big aggregates. Um, so it, it can potentially hang out. I mean, and, and, and for it to sink that far would be, uh, that'd be probably, you know, like something on the order of like a month or several weeks to maybe months of, of sinking time. And so that um, it shows that this, yeah, that this compound can, can stick around for quite a while if, if the conditions are right. I didn't realize that there were bacteria in, the, uh, in oysters that would break it down. Is that, is that, um, is it common or is that, um, I mean, is that something that oysters commonly uh, have associated with them or? Um, so, I mean, so the way I kind of think about it is, you know, like a, like the way the reason cows can like break down grass so well is because they have uh, a bacterial community in their in, in their gut that helps break down all the cellulose and all like those really you know, really hardy materials um, that plants are made out of. And um, it, it wouldn't surprise me that there's some sort of you know, some sort of a symbiosis there between uh, certain bacterial groups and uh, and filter feeders in general that help them break down some other potentially uh, so, ne ne negative ne or potentially you know, bad compounds. Yeah, so for humans who are uh, consuming these shellfish, does that have a protective effect or not? Ooh, Ooh I, th that's a good question. I don't know that. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't know how, you know, how, how that bacteria would uh, survive in our gut. Um, and, then, and then that bacteria would have to really you know, grow, grow. Well, no, I know. mean, um, like, would it sort of neutralize that toxin uh, before people consume the shellfish? Oh, um, well, well, I mean, I, I don't think so because, uh, you know, oysters are, are, are they're filtering, you know, mm. gallons of water uh, a day. And so they can have, um, the, the, the rate at which they're removing the toxin versus the rate at which they're accumulating the toxin is the accumulation rate is more than, than what they're depurating. Um, so, uh, they would have, the, the, the oyster would still have a lot of, or, or the mussel, whatever the, the, the shellfish, shellfish is, would have uh, would still have a lot of toxin that could potentially get you sick. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so, any final 
words? Oh yeah, so this, this is my first publication. Um, and so if anyone's interested in it, uh, you can email me and I can send you a copy if you want to read the, the nitty gritty details of how this uh, was conducted. Uh, my email is uh, I, uh, Marquez, M-A-R-Q-U-E-Z, at disl.edu. Uh, and I'd be happy to share, uh, share, share this uh, research with you. And if, yeah, if anyone has any other questions about that, feel free to, to email me and I'd, I'd be happy to respond. And um, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Alex, for chatting with us this morning. That was really interesting. And thank you all for joining us. Yeah, th thank you again for this uh, opportunity. And, and thanks for everyone who, who joined in. Uh, have a great day.